So I'm going to talk about a bit of a crazy project I've been doing for the last year, which is basically building a cloud from nothing. Um, oh, and by the way, apparently I typed Prague in wrong. Dyslexia for you. So first off, so I'm Chris. Um, I've kind of, this is my third open source conference now. And I'm a bit of a IT jack of all trades. So I kind of, my kind of original background in university was electronic engineering. So I'm quite happy building circuit boards with small IoT devices and stuff. Um, and I also run on the totally alpha end of scale a open source project called Bergamot Monitoring, which is a distributed monitoring platform. Um, and I'm kind of happy in all that scale. But what I do most of my time, my day job, is Postgres. So I'm a Postgres consultant, and I've spoken at a couple of Postgres conferences. Um, although at the moment I'm doing a bit, quite a lot of Java as well. And kind of my talk's all about the cloud and the hardest way to build one. So first off, I thought I would explain what I mean when I talk about the cloud. And it's really easy to first off immediately think of Amazon, Azure, um, Google as the predominant public cloud providers. And you know, some people might think about OpenStack for building on-premise clouds. Uh, I should have really just done OpenStack, to be honest. But yeah, you learn the hard way. But what I consider a cloud really to be is less about scalability that's often talked about with the public cloud, and that the defining factor of the cloud is your ability to scale up and down instantaneously. I think it's much more about automation, autonomy, and abstraction. So it allows us to create and use resources automatically without human intervention. It gives us the autonomy to manage those resources ourselves without human intervention as well. So we can delegate responsibility for resources created to the owners of those resources. And abstraction, we decouple ourselves from the underlying infrastructure that operates those data centers. Data centers are complex things, especially when you're running at the scale of Amazon, et cetera. And we don't need to know anything about how that actually underlying works. And a lot of this kind of talk demonstrates that beer and eBay is not the best combination in the world. Uh, especially, you know, having a few beers in the evening and then buying hardware on eBay at night because that seems like a good idea to do at the time. And I kind of, I've worked on a number of bad OpenStack deployments where I've been having to run services on top of OpenStack that's been deployed badly, sadly, uh, running old versions of OpenStack. And I've had the pain of OpenStack's networking component failing and taking down my production services. And I've worked on a number of migrations from physical um, on-premise environments to the public cloud. So I've also got a fair understanding of uh, the kind of economics of the cloud and the hidden costs that most people don't think about. For example, how much it will cost to send your data to and from availability zones. And as an electronic engineer, I really like hardware. I kind of, it's a bit of a fetish, really. So kind of appealing, buying hardware, playing with it, having my own little pressures. And for the kind of open source projects, I was working on my other kind of uh, work-related projects and non-work-related projects, it's really uh, it became necessary for me to have quite a large-scale test environment. So my monitoring project is a distributed monitoring platform, so I've got lots of different components all talking to each other uh, with things like RabbitMQ going on. And actually to be able to try and make that reliable has proved difficult without actually an adequate test platform. But I'm also trying to do this on a bit of a budget, and I don't want to, I also play around with quite high performance databases where I want quite serious and dedicated um, storage and IO, which is extremely expensive in the public cloud. Hence kind of why all of these factors accumulated for the rather bad idea of building my own little cloud. But 
to be honest, what it's really about is curiosity. I've always loved taking things apart, working out how they work, putting them back together again, probably breaking them. And the whole driver for this was really, it was a way to kind of see all the components of a cloud, or at least the three key principles, how they work and interact together, uh, and how complicated some of the underlying software actually is. And a chance for me to kind of realize and work out how to go about building clouds and better understand how they work and all the infrastructure underneath them. So the main problem with software is it's a bit soft. It needs something to run on. Uh, thankfully, I have a very uh, friendly flatmate who doesn't mind me having servers in the lounge. They make very great coffee tables for a while until it's the summer and it gets a bit hot. Uh, but we need to start somewhere. So we're going to need some compute capacity because we want to run probably VMs or at least applications somehow. And like I said, a lot of everything I bought was bought off eBay. And it's all kind of five-year-old-ish equipment because most corporate entities refresh in a five-year cycle. So you can pick up quite powerful hardware quite cheaply uh, and in relatively good condition. And the economics of hardware, it's been pushed down to the lowest common denominator, really. And they're built as cheap as possible. Uh, and they don't really have much value after they've served their life. So they tend to be cost more to dispose of them, which is why they end up on eBay really cheap. But the other interesting thing is CPU performance hasn't massively um, grown in the last five years or so. In the last, like Compared to, say, 10, 15 years ago, where we'd see doublings of performance in generations, we now see 10, 20%. So cumulatively, CPUs are going more parallel rather than faster. And so you've got a trade-off between spending lots of money for a modern server that's got a really parallelized CPU, with lots of CPU cores, or spending the same amount of money and having 10 boxes slightly older. But for what I wanted, I wanted more redundancy. I wanted more devices, more things talking to each other, more things to go wrong, essentially. And I'm kind of more than happy to have stuff that's out of warranty, to maintain it myself, to void the warranty completely. Um, for example, I've got switches where I've taken fans out and modified them, etc. So now we've got some actual barebone compute and chassis. We're probably going to need to upgrade them a little bit. Most of them don't come necessarily with the kind of RAM I wanted. So shopping around, you know, find modules when they're cheap. RAM prices are going up and up at the moment, weirdly. But going to need lots and lots of RAM sticks. And I also want lots of storage. So I need lots and lots of hard drives. But I'm not buying no all fancy SAS hard drives. I'm just buying really cheap laptop hard drives. Most of them come uh, essentially brand new because they've been pulled out machines when people have put SSDs in. And they're quite cheap to get hold of, just kind of shop around. So I have a whole, had a whole pile of hard drives. And of course, I'm kind of maxing out all the storage in my chassis, so I need some RAID controllers. And again, basically the cheapest ones I could find anywhere um, so that I can connect as many hard drives into them as possible. Then we've got all these servers, lots of storage, lots of memory, lots of CPUs. We need to talk them, we need to get them talking to each other somehow. And one of the things that I, previous environments I've worked in, we've had, say, an NFS server that we've run all our VMs off and it's gone over a gigabit network. It's just really not fast enough for the type of storage and what I wanted to play with. So I wanted 10 gig, which, if you go and look at the list price for a brand new 10 gig switch, you're talking probably 10, 20,000 pounds, uh, which is just totally unaffordable for me. However, there's this great thing of, there's a company called Quanta, which is essentially a white label switch manufacturer. So they produce essentially Broadcom reference designs, and they're mainly bought by big massive data centers and then eventually end up on eBay. So I was able to buy a 24-port 10 gig switch for $300, including shipping from the US. 
And that's actually the complexity there is the manuals are almost impossible to find and take huge amounts of Googling. Uh, and if eventually I did actually manage to get a mate who works for an Owen company to send me a copy of the, the FastPath manual. And the firmware is even more difficult to find. But what was quite interesting is when I took the lid off the, the switch, it did have a little Amazon label over the flash memory. So I'm suspecting it came from an Amazon data center. And I kind of really wanted 10 gig because I want fast VM to VM traffic and also fast storage traffic. And so I've got some switches. Now I need some NICs. Well, again, if you look at list prices, they're quite expensive. Uh, one thing to really note is CAT6 based 10 gig is really, really expensive and actually more latent than fiber based. So I went all fiber because it was much cheaper. Uh, so if you shop around, kind of look around, find stuff when you get it, you can get 10 gig NICs quite cheap. And, you know, gigabyte switches are 10 a penny really and don't cost anything. But because I ended up going 10 gig fiber, I need an awful lot of these little things. These are called SFP plus modules. So they're essentially a fiber optic uh, laser and uh, photodiode that you then plug into the chassis, into the switches and the NICs. Um, with the SFP plus based stuff, you can use something called direct connect, uh, so a direct attach cable, but they're almost impossible to find cheaply, to be honest. So the actual modules are easier to pick up, but you do need one for each end. Uh, and you can also change the fiber and get different lengths. The kind of interesting thing with these little things is it's really easy to find basically the unbranded ones quite cheaply, so the actual OEM manufacturers. It's, however, some of the switches will only let you use branded ones. So if you've got, say, a Cisco switch, it'll only let you use Cisco SFPs unless you dive into the debug commands and disable that. Uh, thankfully, the switches I got don't care because they're Broadcom reference designs. They just don't care about anything. Uh, what's quite irritating, though, is that the Intel NIC driver in the Linux kernel will only allow you to use, by default, Intel SFPs. There is, thankfully, an option to turn that off in the driver. But it's kind of irritating that a free and open source kernel actually limits what you can do with your physical hardware. So I've got everything now. The only things that are easy to forget is the simple things, all the cables to plug it all together with, all the little weird and wonderful cables that you might need inside your servers that you end up getting shipped from China or something that might take a while to arrive, and the different types of power cables you might need based on your data center and what kind of PDUs are provided for you. And you're literally going to need some nuts and bolts because you need to screw stuff into a rack. Uh, and you probably want lots of cable ties, probably Velcro-based. Oh, and don't forget the old serial adapter to talk to those switches. But now we've got all this, what are we going to do with it? Well, one of the great things I like about Linux is it allows you to do some cool stuff for networking that most network engineers don't like you doing. For example, the bonding driver has a mode called balance RR, which allows you to round robin packets across NICs. So it's a great way to build faster interfaces off cheap interfaces. So by keeping my switches separate so that they don't ever talk to each other, I can get 20 gigabits of throughput across my network uh, for storage traffic. And so essentially the design is I want a kind of homogeneous setup where each node in the cluster is doing both compute, storage, and networking. So each VM server is running VMs. It's also running storage, and it's also running networking. And then we've got a couple of gigabit switches that do things like, you know, lights out cards, uh, the host to host traffic for management purposes and the incoming internet. And then the majority of the storage net traffic in the VM to VM traffic all goes over the 10 gig interfaces. And in the end, you end up with something that looks a little bit like that. So a bunch of servers in a rack and lots of cables and you try to make it as neat as possible, and then you try not to break the fibers, uh, and voila, you have a bunch of hardware sat somewhere using a lot of power, not doing very much. So I've got all these things, what do I do with them now? 
Well, this is where it comes down to some smart software and start playing around with different bits of software. So the easiest place to start with is going to be VMs. So most clouds, uh, their predominant unit of computing is a virtual machine. And one of the kind of unsung heroes of virtualization is probably libvirt, which is an API to manage virtualization. So uh, it allows us to work with multiple hypervisors. So it works with Zen, KVM, QMU. Um, it even works with uh, kind of VMware, etc. But for this purpose of this, KVM definitely seems to be the predominant hypervisor at the moment. So I'm going to go with KVM. And thankfully, that's really easy to set up in OpenSUSE. So OpenSUSE leap, install the pattern, KVM dash server, or KVM underscore server even. And we have everything we need for KVM libvirt installed. So one of the reasons for using VMs as opposed to, say, going with alternative units of compute, say, say, a container, is that they've got a pretty mature technology now, and they've got very good security boundaries with all of the CPU extensions over the last 10, 15 years. The boundaries between the VMs is quite a lot stricter than, say, the boundaries between uh, containers. So when we're running multiple tenants that we definitely don't want to be able to talk to each other and don't want to be a security risk to each other, uh, they give us probably the best security guarantee at the moment. And it allows us to be very flexible, allows people to run whatever operating system they kind of want, essentially. And that allows me to run multiple different OSs in kind of my development stacks. So libvirt uses XML for its configuration. And it can get a bit long. This is as short as I could get it to fit on a slide. And essentially, we all we have to do is really configure devices that we want to provide to the VM. We don't really have to know much about the actual underlying technology, how it's actually kind of running. Libvirt will deal with that for us. So we basically tell Libvirt its name and ID, how much memory we want to give it, how many CPUs we want to give it, a couple of you know options about how we deal with uh, CPU feature sets, which will become more important later on. Uh, and then we kind of get into devices and what disks. And to start with, we're going to be storing our, our VM store on local disks uh, to get us up running quickly. And what network interfaces we want and different types of controllers and then a good old graphic stack, so uh, VNC based and keyboard and mouse, etc., to allow us to actually get a shell onto the VMs at some point. And to start with, we're keeping things simple. So we're just using local storage using what's called QM, uh, QCAL2 storage. So that's storing uh, the, the disk volume, so essentially the emulation of a hard drive as a file on your file system. But it's doing it in a way that it can grow as it needs to. So one of the problems you often have with running um, VM platforms where you've got the disks, they say you allocate your 20 gigabyte disk. You don't necessarily want to take 20 gigabytes out of your storage. So what you want to do is called thin provisioning. So QCAL2 gives you the easiest way to do that, running on Linux and libvirt. Uh, and then we're just going to connect it into a bridge that we've got to get access to the internet. So this is kind of as simple as we can do. We get a VM up and running. And then we can use something called Vert Manager to connect to that VM and see it running and use the console. And you know, Vert Manager is pretty reasonable. It allows us to configure most things about the VM, see kind of performance, control it, turn it on and off, uh, add more devices and read devices. Uh, slightly, because it also can talk over SSH, it's really easy for you to connect into your remote data center and manage your VMs. The other nice thing about libvirt is it's got complete API that you can use with bindings in multiple languages. So as a Java developer, it has Java bindings. And I actually have written my own little web UI that allows me to control my VMs as well. But what I really want to do with my VMs is be able to migrate them. And I want to be able to shuffle them around the hosts in my cluster. But I can't do that with local storage, because I can't move the storage. 
So migrate, live migration is really great in that it will copy the memory of the VM over to the other host, pause the VM, and then start the VM up at the other place. But it all relies on that you have shared storage across your VM cluster, and that you can move the state of the VM over to that node and still have access to all the storage. So we've got a number of options to do that. We could say use NFS or iSCSI, uh, but then that kind of violates my initial design of being homogeneous, and it's kind of a bit too simple, to be honest. Or we could use something like DRBD, Direct Replicated Block Device, which has actually some really nice clustering features now as of the uh, uh, version 10 release, so that it can do multiple node clustering and replication. Um, I initially started off playing with something called Sheepdog, which is a little kind of software-defined storage system uh, that's mainly developed and used by, uh, I think it's uh, NTT over in Japan. Um, and that was actually really easy to get up and running, got pretty reasonable performance off it. And then I came to uh, OpenSea's conference back in 2015 or so, and I was chatting to somebody about Ceph. So I've been thinking about having a Ceph cluster for a while, and this was finally a chance to make that reality. So Ceph is a software-defined storage project that allows you to turn a bunch of disks, a little bit of computing capacity, into a kind of storage network. So Ceph basically provides all the smarts to turn those bunch of disks into a shared uh, storage system. So we can access that storage from any node in our cluster. We can read and write the volumes from any node in our cluster. And we distribute that load across our entire cluster. So each of my servers has got about 15 hard drives. And all of those, well, 14 of those hard drives are then partaking in this Ceph cluster. Ceph is then managing all of the data replication between all those devices and redundancy. So you provide Ceph with the rawest you know, components, and Ceph will do all the smarts for you. Um, and it's kind of relatively simple to get up and running, uh, a bit of head scratching in places. So internally, Ceph all is what's called an object store. So all it really understands is little chunks of data. So an object of, say, four megabytes of binary data. And that's then distributed around the cluster. So if you're storing a 20 gigabyte VM volume, you're going to chunk that into lots of little blocks and then scatter that around the cluster. And to do this, it uses what's called the crush algorithm. So it knows the state of uh, all of the disks, essentially, in the cluster and how they're then uh, pulled together into what's called a placement group. Uh, and that placement group is then assigned to a disk, and then there are backups. So Ceph will be able to then calculate from essentially the ID of the object where it's stored. So the whole point of Ceph's architecture is not to have any central points. So you don't have to talk to something to get access to your storage. You talk directly to the disks which is, makes it kind of unique for some of the storage systems. A lot of them rely on you connect to essentially an orchestrator or a distributor, uh, which will then talk to the raw storage. Uh, this actually gives you direct access from the VM down to the individual disks for those chunks of data. And it also provides, layered on top of all this, a whole bunch of different interfaces. So there's something called RDB, the RADOS block device which is what we're primarily going to use. So that is a way to provide raw block devices out of Ceph. So that's exactly what we want to consume in a VM. It's also got CephFS, which is a file system. So you can mount Ceph as a file system directly into your servers or in, into your hosts. Um, it's also got a gateway uh, that implements an S3 style storage API. So you can also have a object store over HTTP like you would in Amazon. Uh, and all of this then backs onto the same storage cluster. So you end up with a very flexible um, system that allows you to provide and access your storage in multiple ways. 
So one of the key things with Ceph is it's designed not to have a single point of failure, and it's not designed, and it's designed for everything to be able to talk to everything essentially. But something needs to coordinate all this, so it has a daemon called the mon, or the monitor nodes. So this is essentially Ceph's consensus system. So it talks an algorithm called Paxos between the three, the three or more nodes. Uh, and they decide the state of your cluster, and then every other component asks those services for the state of the cluster and who to go talk to. So when you're deploying Ceph, this is the first place you start. So I used a tool called Ceph Deploy, um, which is a bunch of Python scripts, essentially, that allow you to deploy Ceph. Uh, and you can literally you know, zip a I in Ceph Deploy, and then tell Ceph to connect to a node, install Ceph, and then create a monitor, and then the monitors will talk to each other, and you have the basis of your Ceph cluster. So before you can do everything, anything else, you need to make sure you've got these monitors. You can run with one monitor, but then you've got a single point of failure. So because it's all consensus-based, you need a majority of nodes any time for the cluster to work. So if you have three nodes, you can lose one monitor node. If you have five nodes, you can lose four nodes or five nodes, you can then use two or three different nodes. So you always need a majority of the cluster to be present for your storage system to work. Uh, so you've got to be careful and think about this because then it depends on how you do maintenance because if you go and take all three of your mon nodes offline, you've then broken your entire cluster. And so once we've got our mon nodes all running and deployed, we can start adding some disks in. So as I mentioned, Ceph basically you provide it with a raw disk. So you don't do any fancy stuff like have a RAID array of all your disks and provide one array up to Ceph. You provide each disk individually because Ceph wants to see the raw volumes so that it can manage the replication across that cluster. Um, so to in add a disk into the cluster, we first off need to zap it, which erases all data on that hard drive. Uh, and because we're using self deploy we're doing this remotely as well, so you have to make sure you get your device names right and don't, don't say SDA, which is probably your operating system. Um, this one's got a nice blank disk. We can then do prepare on it, which will set up the partitions that Ceph wants. Um, and you could potentially then use, a, when I deployed Ceph, it essentially uses an XFS file system on every disk. Um, but the new releases of Ceph now support something called Blue Store, which is a more optimized storage system, which I need to migrate to at some point. And then we can tell Ceph to actually add that disk into the cluster. So by activating it, we then see some data. We see some uh, resource available in the cluster for us to use. And then we go through and do that across all of our disks, which takes a bit of time, to be honest. And as we're adding disks in, or out of the cluster, Ceph will start rebalancing data around it if you've got data there. So when a disk fails, it will automatically start copying that, that data that was on there that's on a then been backed up somewhere else. It will start backing that up again to always make sure you maintain n number of copies. Uh, and as you add more disks in, it will rebalance the data across the cluster so that you always try to use as many of the resources as possible. So now we've got some disks in the cluster, we can actually start using them. So in Ceph, we create pools. So pools have a number of placement groups, which is then spanned across the whole cluster. And this is when we set up replication options. So uh, for the simple setup, we're going to create a RDB pool. So that's just the name. It doesn't actually relate to it's what it does. And we then specify the number of placement uh, placement groups we want. And you have to kind of size this slightly magically based on the number of hard drives you think you've got or you might have, uh, and to how many bits of data you're then going to put on each hard drive. So I've got 96 hard drives, so it gives me about 100 or so um, chunks of data on each drive. And we're going to use replicated mode. So Ceph's got two ways to do data, uh, um, kind of make sure it doesn't lose your data. 
Uh, the easiest option is called replicated. So this is essentially a bit like RAID 1. So every write to Ceph will get written to three devices, or however many you configure. Uh, and then it will always maintain those number of copies of your data. There's more advanced options called erasure codes, which is essentially how RAID 5 works. So there are lots of very complicated polynomial maths that thankfully CPUs can do very quickly these days. But it does much more require on that you have quite a lot more servers and quite a lot more disks than I've got for it to actually have any trade-off of giving you more storage space for all the cost. And when I originally started playing with Ceph, it didn't support thin provisioning on erasured volumes, uh, on erasured pools. So I can, you can't actually use erasure volumes for VM storage at the time. I think you can now with the Luminos. And once we created the pool, we're going to then set a couple of key options. So we're going to set the number of replicas we want of everything. So set size three tells Ceph that it all wants three copies of my data. And then we set a minimum size so that it will stop writes to the cluster if we ever lose um, more than, so we can lose one disk out of the cluster essentially. If, well, uh, when we lose one backup, it will keep working, but if we lose two backups, it will then stop writes into that because it's now only got one copy of the data left. So that allows me to, say, potentially turn an entire machine off for maintenance purposes and my data is still there and everything still works. If I turn two or three off, then it gets a bit more problematic. And then all of this is because we want libvirt to be able to talk to it. So we need to add a user for libvirt. So Ceph auth. So Ceph has an authentication protocol called CephX, which is a little bit like Kerberos, and that essentially ensures that everything is authenticated when talking to all the different daemons because your client's talking directly to the disk daemons. Uh, so we create a user for libvirt. And then next thing we want to do is get libvirt to talk to Ceph. So this requires us telling libvirt the credentials for Ceph. And in the glorious way that this works in libvirt, you have to define a secret definition uh, which tells libvirt the type of secret you want to store. And it gives it an, a UUID. And then we actually tell libvirt the secret. So we, I think we've got commands in the, yeah, so we define the secret, and then we go and actually get the value of the token, so that's a base64 encoded, like 128 bit value or something. And then we have to insert that into uh, libvirt, and we've got to do that on all of our VM servers, so I use Ansible to do all that. So now we're in a position where we can actually get a VM to back onto Ceph. So based off our original example, we can then change our disk definition. So rather than using a QCAL2 file, we're going to put it into Ceph. So first thing we want to do is put the actual file into Ceph. So thankfully, the QMU image tool, uh, which is part of QMU and part of um, all the install of KVM and Levert, can write into Ceph. Uh, Ceph and reading out of Ceph. So we can convert the QCAL2 file we used originally and store it straight into Ceph. So we essentially copy all that data off the local disk and store it into our cluster. And then we can edit the definition of our VM to rather than using a local storage, we can use Ceph. So we have to tell libvirt the secret to use to talk to Ceph, and then we have to tell uh, libvirt the monitor uh, host to go and talk to. So first off, Ceph, uh, the kind of Ceph client will go and talk to the monitors, get the state of the cluster before it can then go and talk to all the underlying disks. So when we configure, as I initially thought it was probably the list of all hosts, it's just the list of the monitors. So I've got five monitors listed and then the port number to talk on. And now I have a VM that's running on shared storage that I can now migrate around as long as I've configured my CPU types correctly. So I then kind of decided one night that I should upgrade to OpenSUSE 42.3. And maybe I had a few too many beers at lunchtime or something, because it sounded like a, a good and simple idea. So I you know, zip it up. Oh, great. I've got loads of errors in my Ceph cluster. 
Uh, that's actually because I've upgraded Ceph by accident. Uh, usually I think it would be advisable to plan upgrades a little bit more than that, uh, but thankfully it all worked out really well. And I decided at that point I should probably go and read the manual to work out how to upgrade, uh, which I was kind of lucky in that the first node I'd done this on was one of the monitor nodes, and you have to do the monitor nodes first. Uh, so that kind of all worked out quite nicely in the end uh, when I upgraded the other five monitor nodes and then went around and upgraded all the storage nodes. And I was very lucky because there, there was a particular option you have to set for the, the latest release of Ceph. And my cluster was new enough that that was a default, otherwise I'd have probably been in trouble. Um, and the only kind of thing that then caught me out was Ceph's latest release, Alumnos, has introduced a manager daemon that gives you more information about the state of the cluster. Uh, and that requires more setup that I didn't know about in advance, but that was fine. And so this is a screenshot of the manager dashboard for my, my little cluster. There's not very much going on at the time I took it. But. And you can drill down and see all the different uh, disk demons you've got, whether they're in the cluster or out of the cluster, and all the pools and stuff in the pools. Uh, it's very, uh, very good for out of the box. So now I've got my VM running on shared storage. I want to be able to bootstrap it somehow. So I want to be able to provide data, uh, some metadata to it that it will then configure the basics, such as network interfaces. So to do this, there's a project called Cloud Init, which is used on most of the public clouds uh, and most of the distributions. And uh, OpenSUSE supports this, and SUSE out of the box. And there's various ways to provide metadata into uh, Cloud Init. You can say use a file, uh, basically a, a CD-ROM file system with some data in it and pass it up. Uh, however, I decided I wanted to use a, a proper metadata API. Uh, so I first off started trying to implement the S3, well, not the S3, the AWS metadata API, which is very complex and sprawling. And then found out the DigitalOcean one's quite a lot simpler, so I'll do that one instead. And then found out that the data source for DigitalOcean uh, instead uh, will only work on DigitalOcean. So I ended up writing my own data source. And actually, that was really quick. In fact, that's the entire data source I wrote in Python on that slide. And that essentially then connects out through a network interface to a daemon running on each of my hosts. And then that daemon can look up in the ARP table uh, to find uh, the particular systems to talk to and provide all the, the configuration for it. So now we've got some VMs uh, running and bootstrapped. We want them to talk together. So I wanted to do this as hard as possible. So I decided to use something called VPP, which is Vector Packet Processing, which is a very high performance uh, user space networking stack. And that essentially gives you a full layer three router in, in software. Uh, it's primarily written by Cisco. And we can connect our VMs into it using something called uh, vhost user interfaces. So this allows our VMs to talk without transitioning into the kernel to talk to VPP to send networking packets. Uh, and we can easily create a socket uh, and add it into a bridge in VPP. And then on the other side, update libvirt to talk to that. So using a particular type of networking adapter. And um, the only difference here is that we have to make sure our VM is backed into huge pages, um, which is slightly problematic, but not too much of a problem. And once we've got VPP, Talking to our VMs, we need to talk between hosts. So uh, ideally, you'd use something called DPDK, which allows you to use the real interface. Uh, but basically, it doesn't work if you've not got an Intel NIC uh, and lots of other BIOS settings tweaked. So I used uh, the host interfaces, so talk through the Linux networking interfaces using something called uh, AF Packet. The only complexity here is you need to make sure they're in promiscuous mode, because VPP is managing all the MAC addresses and IP addresses. 
and now, now that we've got all our hosts talking to each other, we want to uh, overlay networks so that we've got a VM on host A and a VM on host B, and they want to talk to each other. So we're going to use something called VXLAN for that. And we're going to create tunnels from each VM node to each VM node uh, for each tenant that we've got in our networking stack. Now, the problem here is that gets quite time consuming to do manually. And VPP has a nice feature where if you exit the process, it loses all of its state and it has no configuration. So actually, what you now need to do is write a whole daemon to manage a VPP. Uh, so I've started on bits of that, but we'll see where it goes. And my big question at the moment is then, how do I do all the routing, which I haven't worked out. I've partly worked out how to solve, but not quite yet. And to kind of to wrap it all up, was this a smart idea? I don't know, probably not. I should have just used OpenStack, to be honest, but I wouldn't have had fun learning all this in the time uh, and sharing it with you a lot. So, on that note, any questions? None? Right. Okay. So, my final thoughts are, actually, are VMs and the cloud worth it at all with things like Kubernetes? So, Kubic is doing great work on building a Kubernetes platform. And actually, is Kubernetes getting good enough security barriers that you don't need all of this complexity. That's kind of an interesting thought. And is all this a waste of time? Anyway, thank you very much.